It's marinated for a couple of days now. My final thoughts on the Texas and Washington game in the college football playoff. You are Locked On Longhorns, your daily podcast on the Texas Longhorns. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Locked on Longhorns, the show. Jonathan Davis, your host. Today's episode of Locked on Longhorns is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On for $20 off your first purchase. On today's episode of Locked on Longhorns, once again, my final thoughts on the Sugar Bowl that took place on Monday night. But I'm doing it a little bit differently. I'm going to let all of your comments from my Tuesday episode guide my final thoughts on the Sugar Bowl. So this is like the closest we'll ever get to a mailbag episode. I'm always paranoid that if I ask for like mailbag questions on Twitter, nobody will respond. So I just don't do it. But the full episode today, I will be responding to your YouTube comments and using that to guide my final thoughts on what happened on Monday night. All of that and more on today's episode of Locked On Longhorns, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I think this is kind of like the first time I've ever done something like this, but this is also the biggest game that, you know, Texas has played in over a decade, so it makes sense. I usually come out on, you know, like Monday or in this case Tuesday um, and, you know, give like my overarching thoughts on what I thought happened. But I never really come back later on in the week and then like follow up on those initial thoughts and, you know, statements and takeaways I made. This time, you know, because this is a, a huge game and I still see a lot of Texas fans buzzing about it on, you know, social media and just people buzzing about it. Uh, and rightfully so, you know, it was one of the best games of the college football season. Unfortunately, we ended up on the wrong end of it. So thought that I would put it to bed today, talk about it one more time and, you know, give my final thoughts on what happened now that we have more information that's come out since the game ended on Monday night. So the first comment I'm responding to and some of these I already responded to on YouTube, but, you know, I'm just going to respond to them on the show and give my thoughts live. I wish Texas defensive backs were trained to look for the ball. The defensive backs were often in position to disrupt these long receptions had they just looked for the ball rather than watch the receivers complete them. How do you defend a pass if you were in position and do nothing with it? I think this just speaks to how hard it is to play defensive back and how little of a perception we have of how hard their job is, right? Like if you go back and watch those deep receptions and the two that come to mind instantly are the deep one across the middle to Jalen Polk on the first drive um, against Terrence Brooks. And then the one on the sideline that Romeo Dunze, I'm probably saying his name wrong, but he's a stud, right? The one that he caught on the sideline um, against Ryan Watts, where it looked like Ryan Watts got his hand in there, but it was a little bit too late and Romeo Dunze caught it. When you look at those plays, they both got beat on the line of scrimmage, right? Not beat 10 yards down the field. They got beat off the line of scrimmage, which means for the remainder of the route, they are trailing, trying to catch up to Romeo Dunze and Jalen Polk. We have a perception as fans that DBs can run full speed while also turning their head, tracking the ball and making a play on it. And that's just not realistic. So I know that like when you see things happen in full speed, it looks like the defensive back is right there. But right there is relative. (laughs) When you're chasing somebody full speed, you do not have time to turn around, turn your head, look for the ball, track it, and then make a play on it. That's why most of the time when you see a defensive back make a play on the ball, it's because he's reading the receiver's eyes, sees the hands go up, and then puts his hand in position to wedge the ball out. But most of the time, it's luck. I think it's kind of unrealistic to ask DBs who are getting beat and trailing to turn around, look for the ball, and make a play on it. And I think Things happening in full speed give us the perception that the DBs are closer to the wide receivers than they really are. The fact is they got beat. Right. And I just don't think they're you know, I said this on the show, like I don't think there's anything differently that Pete Kukowski could have done, you know, based on the personnel he had. Like when he played 10 yards or seven yards off, they got beat down the field when they played on the line of scrimmage. They got beat immediately with their release. Right. Like. I I just think it really comes down to Michael Penix Jr. and his receivers were better than what we had in the defensive backfield. I do not think it's a scenario in which our DBs were in positions to make plays and just could not find the ball. (laughs) And I think that's very tough to ask DBs to do to run full speed and turn around and try to track the ball like a receiver. But when things happen, you know, in full speed like that, it gives us it gives us the perception that they're a lot closer than they really are. So I think it's just more so about. The wide receivers for Washington were really good. Not that our DBs weren't making plays on the ball. 
Next comment I want to respond to. I felt a big part of the loss was the Texas quarterback, Quinn Ewers, was intimidated by Washington. It just seemed like he lost a step or two. I think the whole team was affected by it. Granted, Washington is a great team, but this Texas team wasn't the team that won the Big 12. I don't think that Quinn Ewers was intimidated, but, you know, intimidated is subjective. I never want to come on here and act like somebody was scared, you know, <laughs> or not ready for the moment. And I think intimidated kind of insinuates that. I think, and I kind of said this all year, our passing game was really basic. Right. And I'm not sure if that was a result of, you know, Steve Sarkeesian trying to spoon feed Quinn Ewers or that's just, you know, the passing offense that, you know, we've ran with this year. But it was a lot of, you know, passes behind the line of scrimmage, a lot of screens. You know, I think like one out of every four of our passes this year was behind the line of scrimmage, maybe a little bit more than that. Um, and then when Quinn Ewers did, you know, have throws down the field, a lot of times they were, you know, where somebody was running wide open or being schemed wide open. Right. So it felt like our passing game was really, you know, just kind of orchestrated rather than, you know, going out there making reads, making progressions and finding the open man. It kind of felt like our passing game had been orchestrated all year. I compared it. I don't know if I ever said this on the show, but I compared it a lot to like um, the early days of Jared Goff and Sean McVay, right. Where they had like a great passing offense and Jared Goff was really good in structure but he had to play within that structure and anytime he got out of that structure he looked like a completely different quarterback i'm not going to say that quinn ewers was intimidated in this game what i said on you know the youtube comment when i responded to it and what i'll say on the show is i just think that in this game quinn's reads were not as simple as they're used to right we were not able to consistently go to our screen game and short passing game and then rely on being a top 10 team in the country in yards after catch that didn't work and i think that his you know reads down the field or across the middle weren't as wide open or weren't as you know in rhythm as he's used to and so i think that it came down to then at that point quinn ewers having to not no longer play within structure. I'm trying to think of the best way to say this. No long, no longer play in the structure and in like the safety net that Steve Sarkeesian provided him, but he had to make plays down the field, right? He had to go through his progressions, make his reads, find who find out who was open, determine what the defense was in, all of that, and then deliver the ball. And I think that that is not something we asked Quinn Ewers to do consistently week in and week out. Like I said, a lot of our passing game this year was in structure. He was forced to play out of structure against Washington, and I think that's why we saw the performance we saw from Quinn Ewers. Hopefully that was a really good way to explain it. Um, I don't think he was intimidated. I don't think he was scared. I just think things weren't as simple as he's used to in the passing game, and you saw the results of that against Washington. But, you know, of course, he's in year two, and that comes with time, right? Development, being able to, you know, um, read the defense, understand what you're seeing, and then make plays off of that. Tech, this is from Alan Watts. Texas is a year away, and so is Quinn. His sideline close-up before the last drive told the story. The fire was out. Sark's job is to keep it burning. I do think I agree that saying Quinn is a year away, right? If, like, we're expecting – because I had the expectation that Quinn Ewers could go in that game, um, and our passing game could be just as effective as Washington's, right? And I was wrong. Um, so I would say that, you know, Quinn could come back next year, make some improvements over the offseason and be that type of quarterback that is a force multiplier, like be that type of quarterback that you go into the game and say, OK, we have the best chance to win because we have Quinn Ewers, similar to the way that Washington went in that game and said, we feel like we can beat anybody because we have Michael Penix Jr. I don't agree that Texas was a year away. Right. We all said. First of all, we all picked Texas to win, right? so we can't come back and say now that they're a year away. And then two, we all felt like the committee got it right and there were four legitimate national championship contenders. And whether you buy into it or not, Texas was a four and a half to five point favorite. That's significant, right? That's more than a field goal. So I do not think Texas was a year away. I think Texas had every opportunity to win the national championship this year. In fact, a lot of people would argue that Michigan or Alabama or on the other side didn't provide much of a daunting I don't know. You know, a lot of people felt like Michigan or Alabama were both teams that Texas could beat in the national championship. So I don't think they were a year away. I think they just got beat, <laughs> you know, on Monday night by Washington. But I do think year three Quinn, you know, if we see him in the playoffs next year, he definitely could be that type of quarterback. That's a force multiplier and the type of quarterback you win games because of not you know, because of the defense and the running game, and then he can make enough plays outside of that. I think next year we could see a version of Quinn Ewers like we saw the last two years of Michael Penix Jr. A quick word from our sponsors, and I continue my thoughts based on your YouTube comments.
Today's episode of Locked on Longhorns is brought to you by Game Time. Game Time is the only ticketing app that gives you complete peace of mind with your purchase. See the view from your seat before you buy so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. All in prices show your total upfront so you know you are getting a great deal before you check out. Buy tickets in seconds with two taps. Game Time is obsessed literally obsessed with finding ways to help you save money on tickets game time has deals on tickets right up to the start of the event and even an hour after it starts it's the place to find last minute seats find exclusive flash deals and sponsored deals on tickets for football basketball baseball concerts comedy theater and more with zone deals you pick the section and game time picks the seats for big time savings and the game time guarantee means you'll always get the best price if you find tickets in the same section and row for less game time will credit you 110 percent of the difference take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time download the game time app create an account and use code locked on for twenty dollars off your first purchase remember terms apply again create an account and redeem code locked on for twenty dollars off download game time today last minute tickets lowest price guaranteed All right, continuing our conversation, no sacks, inaccurate throws, and bad game plan on offense. Could have run the ball, and also this Texas offense is so talented, they can get down the field, no problem. Give credit to the Huskies O-line, Penix had all day. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think that, you know, and this is why I kind of wanted to do this episode, because my first watch, I really didn't think we got a lot of pressure on them. And then, you know, after, you know, seeing, you know, statistics and advanced stats and clips come out on Twitter, we did get a little bit more pressure on them um, than... I thought that we did, but he just did a really good job of navigating it. Also, Ian Boyd made a really good point that Washington was able to hold up and you have to give all the credit in the world to their offensive line with five people. So that allowed them to not have to compress or limit their passing game to make sure that, you know, Texas didn't get a pass rush. Right. They were able to, you know execute their passing game with five people blocking right basically and so they were still able to put out you know three wide receivers and a tight end on every play and that's just something simply that texas could not cover you know for the entirety of the game so you definitely have to give credit to the offensive line uh, i mean you have to give credit to the offensive coordinator for going out there with the game plan and being able to block with five and that allowed them to do everything they wanted to do in the passing game inaccurate throws i've talked about it you know i think one of the biggest reasons that we lost is you can't have 19 incompletions on 71 offensive plays that's just just 19 passing plays that provided you no value. Um, and, you know, obviously there's other reasons we lost, but I think the inaccuracy uh, of Quinn Ewers was a big reason for that. And then no sacks, you know, you know, people make the argument that pressures are just as important as sacks, but I think we saw in this game that it's not right because there were a couple of times, I think Justice Finkley got really close to him. Byron Murphy damn near got a hand on Michael Penix Jr. And both of those led to first downs, right? You know what I mean? Like him escaping that pressure and, and getting to first down. So I think it is a profound point to say no sacks, even though you did get pressure. If he led to, if that led to Michael Penix Jr. Picking up a first down with his arm or his legs, that pressure is null and void. So yeah, the fact that we didn't get any sacks on him, didn't force any negative plays on him is a big reason why Texas lost this game. And then bad game plan on offense. I said that if we would have run the ball 43 times and thrown the ball 28 times, we probably would have won the game. I think Steve Sarkeesian went into the game with the mindset that Quinn Ewers could match Michael Penix Jr. throw for throw. And, you know, maybe that belief or that thought process is the reason that Texas is at home right now. Have enjoyed. This is a new comment. Have enjoyed your show. Oh, Lord. Hold on. I'm not tech savvy. There we go. Have enjoyed your show the past month, Jonathan. You are a class act. Tough game for your horns and another heart stopping win for you, Dub. Good luck to you in Texas and the SEC. God bless. This is one of the, you know, Washington fans that has showed love and, you know, watched the channel and the show for over a month. Um, and I really appreciate the support. And, you know, I'm rooting for Washington for sure to, to go get that natty. I'm rooting for Michael Penny's Jr. from Tampa, Florida. <laughs> you know I mean? As a Washington fan, I appreciate your straightforward analysis of the game. You tell it like it is. It's unbiased. It's real and refreshing. Respect. 40 people like that. I appreciate that comment and all 40 people that co-signed it. Love the show and know you have to do your job. Hate the critics with no skin in the game. I would be a critic, I guess, <laughs> with no skin in the game. Talking behind a mic or their thumbs on X. I am talking behind a mic. I don't do much talking on X. There are very few people in the world that can place a football where it needs to be. 32 NFL quarterbacks and all of them can't do it on the regular. It's not just you as a former player. It disgusts me. 
I know the work that gets put in. It's just sad. Right. Um, you know, I definitely understand what he's saying, you know, as a former player, like it has to be hard to get on Twitter and everybody's criticizing you or get on, you know, these talk shows or whatever platform and see all these people criticizing you. And it's like, I'm the one putting in work. Like you're not the one that's doing my job. And he's right. Like I could come on here and criticize Quinn Ewers and Quinn Ewers could watch this and say, he probably couldn't even throw a ball 30 yards. And I can't, right? Well, I could throw the ball 30 yards, but it's not going to go where I want it to go. Right. So I, you know, I completely understand it, but, um, He's right. We do have a job to do. Right. And I think that, you know, we don't shy away from giving these players credit. Right. Giving these players all the credit in the world when things go well, especially if, you know, I'm assuming by his comment, he's talking about my comments on Quinn Ewers. All season, we've given Quinn Ewers credit. Right. We said Quinn Ewers was the reason, you know, or one of the biggest reasons we got to the Big 12 championship game. Quinn Ewers is one of the biggest reasons we got to the college football playoff. We have already talked about putting Quinn Ewers on, you know, possibly the Mount Rushmore of, you know, um, Texas quarterbacks. And, you know, he's one of the best quarterbacks we've ever seen at the University of Texas. Like this is all praise he has gotten throughout the year. And so I don't think in one game where he clearly did not play his best, most incompletions all, you know, that he had in the game all year, second lowest completion percentage that he had all season, he would tell you he could have played better. So I don't think it's unfair for me to then come on here and say the quarterback who plays the most important position on the field deserves blame for not playing up to his standard the game before we just watched him break literally the big 12 championship record and then he doesn't play well and it's like oh we're being too hard on him he's just a red shirt sophomore that's not you know what i mean i feel like we can't change the standard of how we talk about any player not just quinn ewers based on their performance on the field like i said we you know we want to praise these players and, and, and give them all the the hype and all the credit and say they're the reason for the season and that's cool right because they deserve that but you also have to be able to take the other side of it and be able to say or listen to people give their opinion and say, I've seen him play better than that. He could have played better than that. If he played better than that, we likely win the game. But I am taking nothing away from this comment. I understand. Actually, I don't understand because I can't empathize because, you know what I mean? I'm not a football player, but, you know, I understand it can be tough probably. And, you know, you probably have to listen to a lot of nonsense from people who don't do what you do um, about what you do. Right. But it just comes with the game. You know what I mean? I have no problem coming on here and giving Quinn, Quinn Ewers all the credit in the world. Just like I have no problem coming on here and saying that I think Quinn Ewers could have played better. And like I said, if he was being completely honest, he would tell you he could have played better. You would be a good podcaster on any subject with this approach, the real story or something like that. Your presentation is both confident and knowledgeable. Well done. Thank you. Whether you're a Texas fan, a Washington fan, or just here for the ride, I appreciate that. I think anyone who watched the game would have to say the Washington O-line played really well. They opened enough holes for two rushing touchdowns and a handful of first downs, but their pass blocking was elite, especially against a very tough uh, defensive line. Yeah, you know, they they came in and, and took care of business, right? That was one of the biggest storylines was, yes, this was an elite passing offense, but they had not faced a defensive line that boasted of Andre Sweat and Byron Murphy. Um, and a lot of people, you know, you could just call it, you know, there, there's so much time between, um, you know, announcing these matchups and playing the game. But a lot of people started to question, was the Washington's offensive line the best group in America simply because they played in the Pac-12? And when they faced a more physical team against Texas, would they be able to hold up? And I think a lot of people started to believe that they were going to get exposed on Monday night, but they more than held their own. And that's one of the biggest reasons, um, you know, why Michael Penix Jr. was able to, you know, produce like he was right. Because he had the confidence back there that, you know, he wasn't going to get touched and he had enough time to, you know, make plays down the field. And he certainly did. So um, definitely have to give the offensive line a ton of credit. You know, I think there was a narrative coming into the game that they would not be able to hold up against this Texas defensive line. And they certainly did that and more. Future is bright for Texas. They should be stepping into the SEC with an, an immediate offensive advantage. You should be able to take so many lessons and learning experiences from the semis and also seeing across the field from Penix how it can be done at a really high level. I expect him to take another leap next year, especially with that pressure sitting on the bench behind him. I think these are all really good points, right? At this point, Arch Manning, um, you know, is the backup quarterback. I don't think there's any chance that Arch and Quinn, if Quinn does come back, will be in a real competition. But I do think Arch Manning being on the bench and knowing that, you know, there's a lot of fans clamoring to see Arch Manning can put more pressure on Quinn Ewers. But you're hoping that that pressure, you know, 
builds diamonds rather than burst pipes, right? In terms of seeing Michael Penix Jr. on the other side, you would hope that Quinn has that fire in him. Quinn has that dog in him to say, I can make those throws that Michael Penix Jr. made on Monday night, right? You know, I should be able to come back next year and lead this Texas team to that position to be playing for a national championship to where we're winning games because of my right arm. We're winning games because I am at the quarterback position, right? So, um, you know, I definitely think that viewers can take a look at what Michael Penix Jr. did and say, I should be able to do that. And hopefully that motivates him and fuels him for a year to get back to this position. Um, and then you talk about just making those, you know, minor tweaks for Quinn Ewers, you know, getting better. I think it's just those little things at the quarterback position, right? Being able to, you know, stand tall in the pocket, even when there's pressure around you, right? Being able to go through your progressions, right? Being able to consistently make accurate throws down the field, you know what I mean? Being able to um, allow Steve Sarkeesian to open up this passing offense because you can handle more on your plate. I think all of those things will lead to a more explosive passing offense and a really, really more refined and better version of Quinn Ewers and in 2024 so yeah he has all the talent in the work and uh, he has all the talent in the world excuse me and if he puts in the work and makes those minor tweaks we've said it since literally high school <laughs> like when you were is one of the most talented quarterbacks on the planet like you said some minor tweaks and we'll see that on the field consistently week in and week out quick word from our sponsors and then we finish out the show with more analysis based on your youtube comments Today's episode of Locked On Longhorns is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. The NFL regular season is wrapping up, but there's still time to get in on the action with FanDuel. America's number one sportsbook right now. New customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's $150 in bonus bets, win or lose. The app is so easy to use, and there are so many different ways to bet, like live same game parlays, find bets in the new Explore tab, make a parlay in the Parlay Hub, the best way to find popular parlays and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet a layup. FanDuel, the official partner of the National Football League. All right, Penix is the reason. He is phenomenal. If they beat Michigan, it will be because of him too. The man should have won the Heisman. Without their best running back, it will be more difficult. Not sure if he will play and or what percentage he might be. I think Dylan Johnson is going to play, but I don't know how effective he'll be, one, <laughs> in just terms of being healthy, but two, in terms of that Michigan defense and the way they bull bullied Alabama in the trenches. You know, I'm not sure how well Washington will be able to run the ball, but you are right. Penix is the reason he was phenomenal. I talked about how that performance against Texas in the Sugar Bowl was legendary, and I'm really rooting – for Washington to win the Natty one, just because I love this team, right? You know, I, I've loved them all year, even before we played them for the second time. But two, I don't want Michael Penix Jr.'s Sugar Bowl performance to get lost in the sauce, right? If you think back to Justin Fields against Clemson, and I guess that was that last year, I think 2020, where he threw the six touchdowns, like that was amazing, right? That was a legendary performance. But then they got smoked the next week or you know, the next couple of weeks later against Alabama in the national championship. And so that like, you know, six touchdown performance by Justin Fields, we talk about it every once in a while, but it mostly gets locked, you know, lost in the sauce. I think for Michael Penix Jr., this Washington team and that Sugar Bowl performance to be immortalized, they have to go out there and beat Michigan as well. So I'm rooting for him because he definitely – was legendary on Monday night. One of the most comprehensive and well-organized critiques of a game that I've ever heard. Excellent work. Respect. Two really good teams, but Texas lost because they couldn't get any pressure on Penix. Surprisingly, nothing up the middle when we have a 270-pound freshman center. Thought they would have scouted the Arizona State and Stanford game. Also, Sark stopped running the ball. Michigan will not make that mistake and has me worried. I think Byron Murphy played a better game than, than he's getting credit for. Also, Tavondre Sweat missed a big chunk of the game, which, you know, played a large part in that, you know, not disrespecting anybody on the Texas roster, but, you know, there has been a big drop-off all year in the plays where Byron Murphy and Tavondre Sweat weren't on the field. You saw it in the Sugar Bowl. Like, it felt like every time I looked up and there was a big third down conversion, Tavondre Sweat and Byron Murphy weren't on the field. But Byron Murphy played really well. I think he got some pressure up the middle, but it's hard when you're getting double teamed, especially when Tavondre Sweat's not in the game. But more importantly, you know, pressure didn't mean anything in this game because Michael Penix Jr. was able to avoid it, right? Texas didn't get any sacks. They didn't get him on the ground. They didn't force any negative plays, and that was the biggest reason Washington won. Pre-game analysis, Ewers' completion percentage dropped drastically from the 19 to the 10, and inside the 10, I attached the ESPN splits. His percentage dropped into the 50s, and inside the 10, it's in the 40s while Michael Michael Penix Jr. stays above 62% no matter where he is on the field. You know, I mean, you know, they say men lie, women lie, numbers. 
so I won't sit here and argue with those numbers against Quinn Ewers because they're a fact, right? But what I will say is Texas had one of the worst red zone offenses in the country all year, and that is not solely on Quinn Ewers, right? Everybody, including Steve Sarkeesian, plays a part in that. So, yes, Ewers, you know, completion percentage may drop within the 20s, but that's not the biggest reason that our red zone offense did not perform all year. People seem not to procrastinate that the dogs played Sweat Murphy for Brooks Thompson last year in the Alamo Bowl. We played Ewers worthy o-line etc nothing was a surprise i kept saying we know this texas front seven but all i heard was how great and sweat and murphy were and how they dominate they were invisible except for murphy's touchdown run really shows 99 percent of youtubers analysts really don't do the homework necessary to forecast a game how anyone would take texas minus four points needs counseling washington never trip you don't, why not just be happy that you got a great line right it's like washington you know and had washington plus the points right and made a little bit of, uh, of extra money the fact is, this was a different Texas team, just like it was a different Washington team. And Washington te was just the better team on Monday, right? It had nothing to do with, you know, Washington had already played these guys and, you know, they weren't capable of, you know, stopping Michael Penix Jr. or, you know, doing anything on defense or offense. I think Washington was just the better team, right? Washington was a different team than they were last year in December. Texas was a different team than they were last year in december but washington was just better on monday night watch the replay of the last play clearly pass interference it was not pass interference that's all i have to say about that maybe yours decision making was affected after hitting the back of his head on the turf from braylon bryce's rush the crazy thing is he actually was a lot more efficient and a lot better after that so you know i don't know you know i hope he don't have a concussion i hope he's all right but i think he was a lot better after he got slammed on the turf than he was before if you remember he missed his first what four or five passing attempts so he was actually a, a significantly better after he got slammed to the turf you can blame yours for the end of the game but honestly they were very lucky to even have that chance and texas has not been great in the red zone all year the fact that texas had to try and get a touchdown with 45 seconds left was not yours fault the play calling all over was not great but the fact that texas did not run the ball more was very confusing Washington's weakness all year had been tackling, and they really needed to not take advantage of that and did not. The real reason Texas lost is Penix, Odunze, Polk, McMillan, and Westover, and I include blocking in that, right? You know, like I said, I, I've already explained why I, I blame Quinn Ewers or, or why I put a good amount of blame on Quinn Ewers for the loss. Um, and I just think that, you know, we're kind of getting to the point to where we're coddling Quinn Ewers when we say that we can't criticize him for being the starting quarterback and completing 55% of his passes and having 19 incompletions in the biggest game of the season. If you want to, you know, throw the excuse at me that Michael Penix Jr. is in year six and Quinn Ewers is in year two, so we shouldn't be comparing them, like, that's fine. I'll listen to that. But to say that our starting quarterback should deserve no blame in a game where he statistically played his second worst game of the season, like I said, it's getting to a, a, a point to where it's it's turning into coddling. Good analysis. The biggest disappointments for me were one, the fight in the trenches. Washington online prevented pressure on Penix and lack of a run game. Quinn needs good projection to be effective. I feel like the coaches should have recognized that and adjusted. I think Quinn has always struggled with pressure all the way back to high school. He's much better than last year, but he's still not there. That being said, he's a sophomore playing against a six year star. Right. And we just all we can hope for at this point is that year three, that version of Quinn Ewers is good enough to be one of the best quarterbacks in college football and lead Texas to the promised land. I agree with 100% of everything you said. You need to be the one at the stadium asking the real questions we want answers to and not those clickbait questions. One day, brother. <laughs> one day. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Locked On Longhorns, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We are now putting the Sugar Bowl commentary to rest. <laughs>